Olivia, welcome. I'm so, so excited to talk with you about your research. But before we get into your research, I'm very eager to learn about you, your background, your journey to Wharton, and how, let us get to know you, the person, before we get to dive in to you, the professional. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you, and thank you, Erica, for all you do for the school and the world. I was really doomed to become an economist. Both of my parents are economists, or were, they've now passed. And over the kitchen table in our house, there was a clock which read, time is money. So with that in my environment, what else could I do but become an economist? So I went to high school in Lima, Peru, in Santiago, Chile. My father was posted there as a diplomat. And um, after that, I taught kindergarten, decided that wasn't my cup of tea. And then I went on to teach literacy to the slum dwellers that lived around Lima who didn't know how to read and therefore couldn't even take a bus because they didn't know what it said on the bus. When I went to college in the US, I continued working on development topics. Um, I wrote a senior thesis on uh, the difficulties and challenges of worker self-managed firms in Peru. Then I went on to graduate school where I decided to diversify a little bit and start to study public finance. And um, my first job right out of school was teaching at Cornell University where my department chair said to me, please teach a course on pensions and health insurance. Well, I was 25 years old, I had no clue so I read the book quickly, and I thought, this is an interesting topic. Then I came to Wharton, hired to continue studying pensions and issues of retirement security, and here I am. I've never deviated from that path. Did you always know that you were going to pursue a career in academia? No, I had no idea I was going to become an academic. I always had a five-year plan. So when I finished graduate school, I interviewed with the World Bank, of the Foreign Service, some other companies, and I thought, well, I'll give it five years in academia, and then another five. And here I am, 41 years later, still saying, I'll give it another five. <laughs> uh, and so you've been at Wharton for how long? 30 years, and um, it's been terrific. I was brought in to work on directing the Pension Research Council. Uh, but I've also been uh, teaching. I teach a course now, uh, open to all undergraduates at Penn, called Consumer Financial Decision Making. And it's all about the kinds of things you need to know as an adult moving into the financial world. And you created that course. Nick Rusanoff and I created it. It's always completely booked up. It's a ton of fun. And the students write to me later saying, oh, can you help me with my 401k choice? Uh, things like that. So other than retirement planning, what are some of the other consumer choices that you discuss in the class? Oh, we talk about everything from student loans, whether you should rent or buy a car, take a lease or buy a car, whether credit card problems, whether you should pay only the minimum every month, which too many people do. And then we go through the life cycle. So at some point, you might think about trying to buy a house or an apartment. At some point, you probably early, you should think about disability insurance, life insurance, starting a family, um, all the things that get 529 plans that are tied up with that. And then, of course, we need to think about saving for retirement from a very young age, because if you don't, you're going to not wish that you had a little bit later. Well, let's dive into your research a little bit. I want to take it back to the beginning because your research actually, as you've illuminated, spans decades and covers a variety of different topics in both finance and economics. What drew you to those topics? I know you said you were doomed to study it, but what was it about that, those fields that resonated with you so much? Well, I got involved back in 1992 with a uh, great study called the Health and Retirement Survey. And this is a nationally representative study of people over the age of 50, financed by the National Institute on Aging. And we survey 20,000 people every two years from when they enter until they pass away. And we also have merged with their permission, their social security earnings records, benefit records, 
Medicare records and so forth. So we can see what are the factors driving their retirement saving, when they claim their benefits, and what happens to them in later life. Along the way, I decided to launch a short module on financial literacy, trying to find out answers to very simple questions, one on inflation, one on interest rates, and one on risk diversification. And I was shocked to find out that fewer than half of the older American population, 50 and over, could answer all three questions right. Mm -hmm. So if they can't do that, how are they going to decide if they've saved enough or invested enough? Or maybe they'll withdraw their money too quickly from their retirement pot in, in later life. So that led to a, a big effort to try to enhance financial literacy. Our survey has now been delivered in over 150 countries. It's part of the high school test that they do in Europe to examine students' financial literacy. And it's just been a fascinating effort. That is, um, again, so important and reflecting all of the things that I didn't know when I was coming of age and even into adulthood until it's almost too late to make good choices. Your research delves into the intersection of behavioral economics and retirement planning. So tell us more how you think about the concept of behavioral economics and what does that actually mean? Well, the whole behavioral area has been one of enormous growth over the past 20 years. Um, and as it pertains particularly to the retirement age plus population, what I've focused on is the kinds of things that people don't know about their own future livelihoods. So um, in one very interesting example, uh, a colleague from Microsoft Research showed people a picture of their current face and then with software aged the face. And there was a slider button at the bottom. And as you slid the button to the right, you save more for retirement. The face at the right, your future self, became happier and happier. As you slid the slider to the left, the current face became very cheerful, and the guy on the right was morose. And so this is the kind of thing that you realize people need to visualize their future selves. And in fact, I've recently been talking to people about trying to design an avatar to try to go through alternative retirement scenarios to get a sense of what it would be like if I didn't save, what would happen if I quit like my daughter wanted to at age 45 and retire and so on. And I think that really is helpful and it, it teaches us the kinds of behavioral obstacles people face when they try to visualize themselves in the future. So as I get closer and closer to retirement, we hope not. <laughs> uh, not not anytime soon, but every year I'm closer and closer. I think about, you know, it's, sometimes it can be daunting to think about all of the options and all the considerations. And because for most of us, it's not something that we were taught earlier in life, do you find that as you're interacting with people of different demographic mm -hmm. ages that they are either more or less receptive to learning and changing behaviors in a way that would prepare them for their future retirement? Well, one of the things we've been looking at recently is the concept of longevity risk. Not only people not have to have a sense of, on average, how long they'll live, but also what's the tail of the distribution? What are the chances you'll survive to 85, 95, 105, and so forth? And so what we see is there are big differences, demographic differences. Interestingly enough, in the U.S., the black population seems to think it will live longer than it will, given the objective survival table. Women tend to underestimate how long they will live. So all those factors shape how much you save, whether you claim your Social Security benefits too early, and whether you spend your money too quickly and run out of money in later life. So what we've been doing is trying to come up with simple explanations. Mm -hmm. Did you realize someone, a male at, say, 65, has a 35% chance of living to age 90 and higher for women. Mm -hmm. And that kind of very simple explanation actually gets people to sit up and say, oh, number one, I regret I didn't save enough. Number two, I regret claiming my social security benefits too early. And number three, I wish I had bought long-term care insurance and an annuity. 
So there are ways that we're trying to bring these subjects to people in a way that makes it very concrete and very individual and helps them make better financial decisions. Your work has influenced policy decisions globally. Can you share particular instances where your research directly impacted retirement policies, either here or somewhere outside of the U.S.? And how did it shape your notions for what to study going forward? I had the good fortune to work on President George W. Bush's commission to strengthen Social Security. This was 20-plus years ago. It was a bipartisan commission, eight Democrats, eight Republicans, co-chaired by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Richard Parsons. And it was an amazingly wonderful group, hardworking, really devoted to try to help fix Social Security before we reach the situation we're in now. Um, so we had a good plan, which was basically to reduce the growth rate of benefits, but not cut benefits. And then the second piece was to allow people, if they wanted, to set aside part of their Social Security taxes in a personal account. Long and short of it, due to political opposition and also the fact that that year was 9-11, the plan was dead in the water. It's currently estimated that Social Security will become insolvent by 2033, and Medicare as well, shortly thereafter. And at that point, the benefits will have to be cut by 25 to 30% for everybody, or taxes will have to be increased by about 30%. Around the world, the issue is very consistent. Populations are aging, fertility rates are declining, and so there simply isn't the demographic mass of workers that can help support people in later life to the extent that they become accustomed. And people are living longer. And people are living longer, exactly. So what that says to me is that we're all going to have to work a lot longer. It's not a popular view, and especially in countries like France, where the, the prospect of raising the retirement age from 62 to 64 and drew out math demonstrations in the street. I'm curious whether you think AI has any influence or any role to play in the future of? Well, very interesting topic. Everyone is obviously speculating like crazy. I do think that artificial intelligence can help us do a better job tailoring our, our life cycle saving and investment and withdrawal profile. Uh, right now, the, in the U.S. at least, we tend to have one-size-fits-all solutions. So target date funds are very popular in retirement plan. They say, okay, how old are you? What's the year you're going to turn 65? Boom, we're going to put you in that target date fund. And the rest is, is not necessary to be discussed. But obviously, people are different. Right now, if you put in simple questions to AI, you know, they tell you, well, 60-40 is a good stock bond allocation. It's still very simple. So there's some time. And the other problem is that at the payout phase, things get much more complicated. So there's progress. There's optimism. Um, and I can't wait to see what happens. I think that's true for, for many of us. What do you find has been the most challenging thing to convey to either organizations or to individuals to help them understand the urgency of needing to find solutions for our current problems with the pension and social security systems? Probably the most difficult concept is a deep-rooted one, which is that people simply have a hard time thinking into the future. Way back when, when I started working with the Social Security Administration, they only used a 10-year projection period to see if the system was solvent. Well, 10 years is nothing for people that are just starting their work lives or even age 55 or 60. So over time, Congress induced Social Security to take a 75-year window. So now they do their pro projections for that period. And they're their logic is that, well, the baby born today will probably live to age 75, but there are a lot of more babies who are going to live beyond that. And so now we need to take a much longer perspective. Their answer, and somewhat credibly, is that, well, 
who knows what's going to happen in the future. We may all get COVID again, or we may cure cancer and live to be 2000. But the point is, if you're putting in place one of the biggest government expenditure programs in the world, and you're not making long-term projections, then you really have a hard time making tweaks as you go along and as the world changes. So future focus, I think, is really one of the bigger, more difficult things to convey. So one of the things that I have appreciated about the way you have navigated your career at Wharton is that you've been very engaged with the public sector, you've been very engaged with the corporate sector, uh, including TIAA. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done or the partnership that you've created with TIAA? So TIAA has been an amazing supporter of the Pension Research Council. I've actually been a participant in TIAA since I was 25 years old, so I'm a long-term supporter. One of the reasons that I think it's such an interesting partner is that they are not only interested, you know, seriously doing a good job providing people with retirement saving and payouts, but they're also devoted to the research. And um, way back when, the Pension Research Council published a book that its CEO uh, had written called It's My Retirement Money, Take Good Care of It. And we've consistently partnered with their various people through the years. So over about the last eight years, TIA and the Pension Research Council have combined forces to issue calls for proposals to any researcher in the U.S. at a government, nonprofit, or academic institution. We've sponsored numerous different research studies, including, I'm happy to say, some of mine, one of their very interesting products that they provide is something called a participating annuity. No other U.S. company has these because it was allowed by Congress back in the Stone Age. And essentially what this is, is it's an insurance product which guarantees you a payout the rest of your life, no matter how long or short you live. But the insurance company doesn't have to bear the risk of surprises to the mortality table. So if all of a sudden everybody lives 10 years longer or COVID comes along, the participants in the pool share that risk. So what it means is their product is much less expensive than any other annuity on the market. It's quite prevalent in Europe. You see it elsewhere. How can we do better integrating lifetime income streams into the 401k world, the defined contribution world? So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about your time specifically at Wharton. Mm -hmm. You've been here for 30 years. How have you seen the school evolve in that time, particularly with respect to the department that you're in and mm -hmm. the nature of the research and the students over those 30 years? When I would join Wharton, I joined a department called the Department of Insurance and Risk Management. And my predecessor, Dan McGill, had founded the Pension Research Council to bring greater knowledge and integration into the field of retirement research. So he brought in actuaries. He brought in insurance folk. Um, when I came in, the world had changed somewhat. Instead of everybody having defined benefit pensions, like in the auto industry and um, so forth, which was the old norm, the new norm is defined contribution plans. So I broadened our perspective to be able to include plan design discussions, uh, studies of participant behavior, and so forth. Uh, and now I'm delighted to say we've celebrated our 70th anniversary for the Pension Research Council. I have a wonderful advisory board, many of them Wharton grads, I'm happy to say. And the nice conversation we have within our board spans academic and industry and policy problems and issues and challenges. So it's a great way for me as a faculty member and our academic colleagues to get grounded, to really say, what's coming up? What's the ne next issue? How can we help policymakers solve some of the problems in industry as well? And I think it's very opportune to say in this world of global aging, I am excited to see what the Pension Research Council can accomplish in the next 70 years. So as we think about the future, uh, I want to 
again, sort of ground us in the Wharton context, or actually higher education and academia in general, as a senior stateswoman in your field and as a senior uh, scholar, what advice do you have for future, current and future young scholars in this field? I see the area of pensions or retirement as a microcosm of almost everything. It's got consumer behavior. It's got industry structure. It's got macro and microeconomics. It's got psychology. And so when I first started down this path, there was some discouragement because it was so multidisciplinary. And that's often something that in the rest of the world, in other academic institutions, is frowned on. One of the great things about Wharton is it does encourage multidisciplinary research and collaboration. And so that's been wonderful. Of course, good scholarship of any type demands a strong foundation. So um, I always tell my students, do what's difficult when you're in school because you have to force yourself, I didn't have to force myself to really learn statistics and econometrics and the things that I couldn't sit down with a book under a tree and read and learn. And then with that edifice, you can do all sorts of things the rest of your life. So on top of that strong foundation, in my field, it would be finance and economics and econometrics and statistics. I think it's also important to read widely and talk to people. So understanding that we're all different, our solutions are different, our problems are very similar, um, but we can learn from each other. And that has been a, a real joy here at Warden. Wonderful. So one of the first, actually the first person that we interviewed for this series, what I've learned, was Anita Summers. She was one of the first uh, female faculty members at the Wharton School in economics and policy. And, and she talked about the experience early in her career of being a woman in a field that was not necessarily considered to be the domain of women. Have you found any challenge either earlier on in your career or in modern day of studying this or unique things that you bring to the understanding of this field because of your gender? Well, my mother actually um, applied to a PhD program at Harvard in economics. And the only reason they let her in is she agreed to type the department chairman's papers. <laughs> so, you know, that goes back. Um, I think, sure, 30, 40 years ago, I would be in a room with 100 other economists and I'd be the only female. I would say that being in a school with yourself as dean, with very prominent women, that was what attracted me to Wharton, actually, when I did make the move. Uh, there were very strong women presidents of Penn over the years, um, and that makes a difference. It makes the environment more, more friendly. Of course, over the years, uh, one also figures out how to speak and who, whom to speak with and what top and when to speak. That's the most important thing. Um, but I believe that it's been a very nurturing environment, and it continues to be so. And so for that, I thank you and your predecessors that have done such a great job. It is an incredible culture here at the Wharton School. So final question. The series is called What I've Learned. Oh. Uh -huh. So if we were to end with your greatest piece of advice, uh, with what you've learned over the years, what would that be? And it may not have anything to do with pension research. I would say just don't give up. In fact, my dearly departed mother used to say, overcome, dear, overcome. And um, that, that mantra really stands one in good stead. I had a number of brilliant friends and co-students in graduate school, some of whom never went anywhere because they got discouraged. They got a rejection letter from a journal and put it in the drawer and never looked at it again. Um, and it's not like we haven't had our challenges over the, the years, but um, usually there's a different path if you can't go over, over it or under it, go around it. And that's the advice I try to give my students. I also try to tell them Try to think of questions such that no matter what the answer is, it's always interesting. So, you know, you don't want to say, is X true, and then find out it's not, and then what do you do? You want to say, 
why is X true or not true? Or what can I learn from that? So part of what I try to do in teaching is try to help people ask interesting questions. Well, Olivia, I've learned a lot from you, and I know that you have generations of students who have benefited from your engagement with them in the classroom, and we're really thrilled that you have chosen Wharton to be your academic home and will continue to be here, hopefully, for quite some time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. It's a pleasure. <laughs>